Hi, my name is Kyle Holmrass and I coordinate the Activist Network for Greenpeace here in Washington, D.C. A short while ago, we sent a survey to all the Activist Network members asking what you thought could be better about the Activist Network. If you remember also, one of the questions regarded Alaska and receiving a video. Well, that's what this video is about. In this video, you'll see incredible footage on Alaska's coastline and the, th the threat it's under from oil and gas development companies. This video is going to go to 800 different people and what we're hoping you'll do is take this into your home, invite your family and your friends over and watch this video and then I'll sit down together collectively and write a letter to the politicians. Together all of you can create change. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the video and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Elaine Miles of Northern Exposure. Alaska seems a place of unspoiled beauty, home to the grizzly bear and the salmon and the beluga whale. But in a real Alaska, oil development is poisoning the waters and the wildlife and the people day by day. The Exxon Valdez spill showed us the devastating impact of oil. Despite this, almost every mile of Alaskan coast is slated for oil and gas development. Is this dirty energy worth the price? Reaching north out of the Gulf of Alaska, Cook Inlet stretches 200 miles along the Kenai Peninsula. Time and nature have formed this rich estuary, from the ice fields of the Chugash Mountains to the active volcanoes of the Alaska Range. Cook Inlet is cradled between these spectacular mountains and fed by a vast network of glacial rivers. Some of the most extreme tides in the world, rising and falling as much as 40 feet, rip in and out of Cook Inlet. In winter, thick slabs of sea ice move with the tides. Cook Inlet serves as a nursery for an abundance of sea life. Five species of salmon, halibut, seals, sea lions, seabirds, and beluga whales all call Cook Inlet home. Native cultures along the Kenai Peninsula have subsisted on the fish and shellfish for thousands of years. Fish is a part of us. It has been a part of us from before we can even remember. Raven said we would have this fish forever. The rich waters of Cook Inlet are vital to all the people who live along its shores. The first thing I see in the morning when I get up is Cook Inlet. The last thing I see before I go to bed tonight will be Cook Inlet. Um, I smell it when the wind is right. Cook Inlet defines my community here, Cook Inlet and Kachemak Bay. It gives it the character that makes it the place that I wanted to be and still want to be. In a way, it's everything. But Cook Inlet is in danger. The oil and gas industry have been polluting the inlet in the Kenai Peninsula for 30 years. From its offshore drilling and processing to waste disposal and transportation, the oil industry in Alaska has become a deadly neighbor. Well, in this case, we got about 15 oil rigs smack in the middle of some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Since the arrival of the oil industry, the fishing community in Cook Inlet has been forced to live with fear and uncertainty. There were over 300 oil spills in and around Cook Inlet just between 1988 and 1992. In the largest spill, the tanker Glacier Bay spilled 160,000 gallons of oil into these waters. Theo Matthews represents Cook Inlet 600 drift fishermen. It takes very little oil in the water to absolutely eliminate our fishery. The oil companies are well aware of the financial and social importance of, uh, of our industry. But when it comes to the bottom line in Houston, that's what it is. It's the Houston bottom line. And, uh, 
that's what we resist here. Betty Fairley is a lifelong resident of Alaska and mother of three children. She and her neighbors are concerned about the toxic waste the oil industry is dumping into Cook Inlet. We shouldn't have to choose between oil and our fisheries, and that's what the oil industry is forcing us to do when they dump daily into Cook Inlet. The oil industry dumps waste that should be considered hazardous. In 1980, Congress exempted oil industry waste from the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA, the law governing hazardous waste. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, this exemption saves the oil industry billions of dollars each year. The oil industry would have us believe that processed waters are nothing but water that is brought up with oil in a briny waste. But in reality, processed waters are some of the most complex toxic chemical waste known to man. There's benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene. Using the industry's own data, Betty Fairley produced a report showing that hazardous waste dumped into Cook Inlet poses a serious threat to human health and the environment. The report was released in 1991 by the Public Awareness Committee for the Environment. What I used were scientists' reports. What I used was sound data. And I studied and I researched everything through reading and through um, EPA documents and through oil industry figures themselves. The figures I used in my report all come from the oil industry. They can't refute that. Oil companies spent thousands of dollars hiring a consulting firm in an attempt to refute Betty Fairley's report. Later investigations by the trustees for Alaska and the environmental law firm confirmed Betty Fairley's work. Their findings proved a repeated pattern of negligence by the oil industry in Cook Inlet. From 1987 to 1992, the oil industry in Cook Inlet committed over 3,000 water quality violations. They also discharged 7.5 billion gallons of contaminated production waters and over 31.5 million gallons of drilling waste. These wastes contain acute toxins, such as petroleum, mercury, cadmium, and formaldehyde. I don't believe any of this dumping will stop until we, again, put hazardous chemicals in the category that RECRA originally intended them, which is in the hazardous waste category. On shore, the process of producing and refining the oil has made the Kenai Peninsula one of the nation's toxic hotspots. According to the EPA, the Kenai Peninsula borough consistently has the highest levels of toxic releases in a region that includes Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. People go there to enjoy the uh, scenic beauty and the, the resources that come along with wild places. Most of those people bought their land without having any idea that they were buying land that was either contaminated by or adjacent to land contaminated by oil, oil industry waste. The Kenai Peninsula is now home to a vast network of oil rigs, pipelines, terminals, refineries, and waste sites. Every year, the three petrochemical facilities located in the small town of Nikiski release millions of pounds of toxic pollutants. The largest polluter, the Unical Mitsubishi Chemical Plant, released nearly 14 million pounds of toxic chemicals in 1990 alone. In 1987, Tesoro spilled 616 thousand gallons of petroleum, which is now contaminating the groundwater. Chevron dumped 70,000 tons of PCB contaminated soil in the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge during the 1970s. The Marathon Oil Trading Bay plant discharges radioactive waste directly into Cook Inlet. The failure of government agencies to regulate the oil and gas industry on the Kenai Peninsula has left residents with a frightening legacy of pollution. The toxic legacy of this plant began as soon as it opened up. Within the first years of operation, plant officials falsified their permit applications 
and lied on their submissions of the reports to EPA. They were caught and heavily fined, but this didn't stop the plant. Having got caught again, they took their hazardous waste and they dumped it in their sewage treatment lagoon in violation of RICRA and the Clean Water Act. They got caught again, but that didn't stop them. Then they dumped it into open pits with bulldozers. Only when employees of the plant notified the EPA did they stop this practice. They have a system of 200 underground injection wells, which are barrels where they dump all their processed water and their waste. And consequently, the, the entire groundwater under this facility has become contaminated. For nearly 15 years, the oil industry dumped toxic waste into unlined pits near the town of Sterling. Sterling residents also fear that an Arco well blowout contaminated their groundwater. Our children were here with the grandbaby and uh, we all got sick. My daughter was pregnant. Uh, she ended up with having to abort the fetus. It just went from one thing to the next, actually. And my husband at first just thought I was out of my head when I said my mouth was starting to peel and my mouth was burning. And then I began to realize there was something very wrong. It began to burn us when we showered. Analysis of the well water in 1989 revealed the presence of known cancer-causing petrochemicals. Doctors determined that toxic exposure caused the family's health problems. In a recent study, the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation listed over 150 abandoned and uncontrolled hazardous waste dump sites on the peninsula. These sites are breeding grounds for contaminants that threaten human health. On a walk through the woods near his home, Gary Askolkoff accidentally fell into an abandoned waste site. This particular uh, uh, chunk of drilling mud is uh, uh, fairly upsetting to me because of the fact that I did fall in it. I uh, uh, found that it uh, dried my skin. Uh, and uh, caused my hand to tingle for probably about a year afterwards, maybe even a year and a half. I'm pretty disgusted uh, on the personal level. Uh, you can't help after you've had uh, first-hand experience in these woods, as I have over the years, to, uh, uh, to be disgusted with uh, those who tend to leave their garbage, and that's basically what the oil company has done. Uh, it has come here, it has uh, taken what it's wanted, and uh, it has left its garbage. The oil industry also uses more creative ways to dispose of its hazardous waste. This is a playground at Nikiski Elementary School. About 10 years ago, an oil company made a, a generous offer. They donated oil field pipe for the construction of this swing set. Unfortunately, the pipe was radioactive. Right now there are no laws governing the disposal of this oil field radioactive waste. Such incidents as the donation of radioactive pipe for schoolyard use is not against the law. The residents of West Poppy Lane, a quiet street near the town of Kenai, know firsthand the effects of living with toxic waste. Charles Dixon is a former Poppy Lane resident. We kept noticing pump trucks backing up into the gravel pit all hours of the day and night, discharging uh, liquids onto the ground and then driving off. This went on for quite some time. My wife and I thought the problem, since we had reported it to the state, had been taken care of. Well, they continued to dump, they continued to dump, they continued to dump. So I started investigating myself as to what these materials were that they were dumping. And I found that they were drilling muds and other waste from the oil industry from their operations in the gas field right behind us here. Uh, and I also found out that they had no permit to dump anything here and that what they were doing was in fact illegal. Union Oil Company, now Unical, used the Poppy Lane gravel pit as an illegal dump site for their hazardous waste for over 20 years. These pollutants are classified as extremely and acutely toxic, and they have contaminated the soil and groundwater of this residential neighborhood. My wife developed asthma. She had never had any allergies before. Now she's allergic to everything. She's on medicine that cost her several hundred dollars a month. 
Uh, she has sores on her skin, the same as I do. Unical refused to take responsibility for the contamination until local residents sued. By the time a settlement was reached, property values had dropped to nothing, and families were forced to move from their homes. I had to file a lawsuit against the oil industry myself because my state officials were unwilling to do what was necessary and what was required by them by the law. They looked the other way. It's affected my family's health. You can't do this to your friends and neighbors all in the name of corporate profits. That's all it is. If you save $20 million in doing something like this, how many lives is it worth? How many lives are a barrel of oil worth? Loading and transporting oil in Cook Inlet is extremely dangerous. The Drift River Oil Terminal was built beneath Mount Redoubt, an active volcano. Eruptions of the volcano during the winter of 1990 forced the evacuation and shutdown of the terminal. According to the Alaska Marine Pilots Association, Cook Inlet is one of the most hazardous places to navigate tankers in the world. What we've asked for is tanker escort vessels, basically tractor tugs. We have the second highest tides, I believe, in the world here. We have winter ice conditions. We have two of the poorest dock facilities, probably in the United States. Today, tankers navigate through these treacherous waters unescorted. Cook Inlet is the only port in the Western world that docks tankers without tug assistance. In March of 1989, the people of Cook Inlet paid the real price for shipping oil in these waters. The Exxon Valdez went aground in Prince William Sound, spilling 11 million gallons of crude oil. Eventually, over 1,200 miles of Alaska's coastline were contaminated. Then it came around, around our coastal waters here. It was un with utter disbelief. I remember the elders that attended a meeting I attended in Anchorage there at the, our native nonprofit. And he said when he got up in the airplane flying in from Cordova, all he could do was cry. He said he had never, ever in his life dreamt that he could see this black stuff all over the water. And he said that it was death, nothing but death. That's all he could think of, because it was so black. One of the things Eleanor McMullen is chief really of the Native inside. community of Port Graham. Since the oil spill, Native people no longer trust that it is safe to eat their traditional foods from the sea. Before the oil spill, some of the villages along my, in my region were uh, subsisted. Literally, that's all they had. They don't have grocery stores. They didn't have stores to go to uh, to get a box of groceries in from another area would cost lots of money. And uh, so they relied specifically on subsistence. And that subsistence no longer is there. You don't have to dig very deep and you find lots of pain, lots of frustration. Dealing with the stress and not being able to, you know, um, talk about it and release it in some way. Constant day-to-day -day dealing with the oil spill, cleaning it up, being out on the beach and away, f away from your family. During 89, uh, you know, from that point on, there, I think there's still still effects of it. it it's, it sure affected me. You know, I've got more gray hair and, and uh, every time I talk about this thing, it, it, I get more upset than I actually was in, in 89. Yeah, Exxon rides from a helicopter and says, it looks clean, we're back to normal. Baloney, it isn't. You know, the stuff, when the sun hits it, it goes under the rocks. You know, it, it appears to be clean and it's not. You know, and when it gets hot again, you know, it'll, with the tide coming in, it'll seep out again. 
It's four years now since uh, it's not well recovered yet. It's still, you know, like I said, there's a lot of fear there and the people don't want to pick no more of these uh, seafoods around this area on the shoreline here because uh, they, they think that they're still affected and uh, they don't want to eat them. One of the concerns people have is if we continue to eat these foods and that they're contaminated and and who's going to monitor our health? Who's going to make sure that down 10 years from now that if a lot of um, cancer or whatever happens occurs, is it, is it going to be connected to, to what we have eaten? I don't know if I'd want my baby to eat any of it. I don't know how to explain it. Um, you know how when when you're brought up, you know, harvesting, subsisting, you know, you have this safe feeling. And, you know, in 1989, that safe feeling was, you know, just taken away from us. The Exxon spill continues to devastate the commercial fishery in Cook Inlet. We had hoped that the system was going to recover and it was maybe just a one-year failure. Then we found out uh, last year that 1995 looks to be a complete failure for the Kenai system. And unfortunately, we just found out two weeks ago that the 1996 run, based on this year's out-migration, looks as bad as 1995. So we, we're going to have multiple failures due to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And basically, we represent 600 fishermen that won't have a livelihood for three years. Since the spill, Exxon has spent millions of dollars to convince the public that the area has recovered. The truth is that oil from the Valdez continues to poison the waters. Scientists predict that recovery of the marine environment will take decades. Despite the environmental devastation caused by the oil industry over the past 30 years, the United States Department of the Interior proposes to lease 82 million acres off the coast of Alaska to the oil and gas industry. The first federal sale would open 3 million acres of Alaska's lower Cook Inlet. ARCO expects major recoveries here that rival the largest oil fields in Alaska. Both the federal government and the state of Alaska are going ahead with sales though no comprehensive study of the impacts has ever been done. This would extend the oil and gas industry's access to vast new offshore areas far from existing development. The Mineral Management Services plans to develop Lower Cook Inlet and Shalikoff are really incompatible with maintaining um, the pristine nature of the area and, and they're rather um, it's adding insult to injury after the Exxon Valdez. Every day when I see a can uh, tanker come in, I have a sinking feeling. And every day I wonder, is this the one? I think, again, it's the question of whether or not in order to maintain cheap gas at the lowest price that's ever been available um, in real dollars, are we sacrificing people like myself and those who depend on that for their livelihood. I just don't know, uh, but uh, I feel that uh, it's going to be bad. I mean, it's going to be bad for these other uh, villages here around us, you know. And I don't know what's going to happen. That's all I know is I think uh, it could wipe the whole uh, Cook Inlet here. In Cook Inlet and throughout Alaska, Many native villages have passed resolutions opposing offshore oil development. The traditional Denina Council would like to stop the, the gas and oil, and there are several reasons why. And one of them is because of our subsistence way of life and um, other factors such as our health. When you impact one part of our life cycle, then you're, you've impar impacted the entire thing. There's a link missing, so it, it affects all of us in every way. Um, I don't think they understand that. They say we need Alaskan oil for our cars and to heat our homes, but we don't. We have alternatives. All the oil in Alaska would fuel the energy needs of the United States for less than one year. 
and global warming caused by burning oil and other fossil fuels threatens the very survival of life on the planet. There are cleaner sources of energy available today. Help create a safe and healthy energy future.